So here are my disclosures. Um, so before we get into the meat of all the data that I'm gonna show you, I first wanna talk a little bit about staging because you're gonna hear this over and over again. So uh, we used to use the seventh edition of the AJCC and in fact most of the trials data that I'm gonna show you uses the seventh edition. And specifically for the stage three patients, which really refers to any lymph node positivity or, or uh, presence of in-transit or satellite metastases, these are the stage three patients. And so initially in the seventh edition, categorized the stage uh, 3A to 3C with uh, the survival curves shown in this slide. Uh, now we're on to the eighth edition, and now we have four scrub subgroups, stage 3A to 3D, majority of patients um, uh, uh, our, our, our earlier stage, so stage 3A to 3C, with a very small uh, minority of patients being the very high risk stage 3D patients. But just with that sort of background under our belt, we'll, we'll dive into um, the adjuvant therapy space. So fortunately, uh, we don't use interferon much anymore. I, I think um, I was lucky. I came into practice and was using interferon, I think, in two patients that I can really recall, and that was not willingly. So these medications, um, benefit was all is controversial, toxicities are excessive, um, maybe this, these medications would improve PFS, but the OS uh, uh, data was always controversial, and thankfully, we don't use these medications and, and just sort of harken back to the, the bad old days of melanoma with these drugs. Um, a little bit more uh, recently, biochemo. This is a nostalgic slide, so I trained in a center where we use biochemo all the time. Um, but basically, this was a cooperative group study uh, for surgically resected stage 3A to 3C melanoma patients, randomized to an either a year of interferon or nine weeks of biochemo with co-primary endpoints of RFS and OS. And what you can see with the panel on the left here is that the biochemo did significantly better in terms of improving relapse-free survival, but there was really no overall survival benefit. And because of the lack of overall survival benefit and because of the significant toxicities of the regimen and the need for inpatient hospital stay, biochemo was never, never really used widely except in large volume melanoma centers. More recently and uh, uh, relevantly, I think, is the EORTC 18071 study. So this study um, was done uh, with surgically resected stage 3A to 3C melanoma patients being randomized to either placebo or IPI at 10 mg per kg. So obviously this is what is called the high-dose IPI regimen metastatic melanoma. We tend to use the 3 mg per kg dose. Um, but for this trial, they used the 10 mg per kg dose, um, which is important. And um, the primary endpoint here was relapse resurvival. survival And you can see with the blue line, it's the IPI patients, and those patients are having statistically significant improvement in their relapse resurvival survival with a hazard ratio of 0.75 over the placebo. Of course, this is a very toxic regimen, so treatment-related toxicities 42% or higher, grade three, including five people who actually died from uh, toxicity in this trial. But this was actually critically an important study because this was the first drug to, I think, really convincingly show overall survival benefit, and they recently updated the OS curves, and this is now with the seven-year estimates, a 60% uh, um, seven-year uh, overall survival for the IPI-treated patients compared to about 51% for placebo. So again, a lot of toxicity, but definitely um, um, moving the curve and uh, uh, curing, I, I think, a subset of patients who got this very toxic regimen. Uh, this is the ECOG 1609, so this is a study that I think we had been hearing about for a number of years and was just finally published. Um, and so this was for uh, patients with a surgically resected stage 3B, 3C, up to M1B uh, melanoma, randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio to either high-dose interferon for a year, or IPI 3 mg per kg, or IPI 10 mg per kg. And the panel, and, and the primary endpoints here uh, were RFS and OS, and so the panels on on top here are the IPI 3 mg per kg in red compared to high dose interferon, and it just barely meets the statistical significance for overall survival benefit for IPI 3 mg per kg, um, and, and perhaps a trend towards improved RFS for IPI 3 mg per kg uh, uh, here. But with the IPI 10 mg per kg, these, these curves are essentially overlapping. There is perhaps um, a, a trend towards improved OS and RFS for IPI 10 mg per kg compared 
compared to interferon, uh, but did not meet its statistical significance, pr probably due to toxicity. Uh, but the authors here um, sort of specified that they think that IPI-3 mg per kg, based on this uh, trial data, would be a very reasonable um, adjuvant treatment option, or at least a reasonable adjuvant treatment option compared to IPI-10 mg per kg. Of course, toxicity is a huge issue anytime we're discussing IPI, and here was their uh, treatment-related toxicities, grade 3 or 4, as well as grade 5. So obviously, IPI-3 mg per kg is much safer than IPI-10 mg per kg. Um, I, I think the jury's still a little bit out in terms of where IPI is used in the adjuvant setting, if at all, uh, these days based on uh, these next studies that I'm going to show you. So these are, are really, I think, the most, some of the most important studies that are coming up here. And so these were two different anti-PD-1 uh, antibody trials. Um, so if we start with the Keynote 54, this was for patients with seventh edition resected stage 3A to 3C melanoma, randomized to either placebo or PEMBRO for a year with the primary endpoint of relapse-free survival in the entire cohort. And um, Checkmate 238 was a little bit different, uh, focused on a higher-risk patient population, so resected stage 3B uh, all the way up to stage 4 resected disease, randomized to IPI, um, uh, 10 mg per kg with a NEVO placebo, or NEVO, 3 mg per kg with an IPI placebo, and again, with primary endpoint of relapse-free survival. Again, an important point, which I really should have mentioned, all of these studies required completion nodal dissections, um, and also in patients that had minimal nodal disease, they clarified that they wanted patients that had high enough risk, which was deemed to be the patients with at least a millimeter size of melanoma in their lymph nodes, which I think is an important point. And so here's really the, the primary take home in terms of the RFS analyses for these two trials. Panel on the right is the Keynote 54, and you can see PEMBRO is doing far superior to placebo in terms of recurrence-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.57 um, and one-year RFS rates of 75 percent compared to 61 percent for a placebo. A checkmate 238 is shown in the panel on the left and again um, IPI, I'm sorry, NEVO is doing significantly better than the IPI-10 mix per kg with three-year RFS data of 58 percent compared to 45 percent and you may have recalled seeing that as a question in your in your pretest. Uh, this is the data um, um, in, in uh, in reference to that question. And so obviously amazing results, uh, and importantly, the toxicity of these regimens is far superior in terms of manageable manageability uh, with grade three or higher toxicities for PD-1 regimens, about 15%, 14 and a half, 15%. And importantly, only about 10% of patients that are having toxicities that are severe enough that they actually have to re, uh, stop the treatment before the uh, specified, pre-specified one-year duration was up. Of course, IPI toxicities are severe, as we know, and that's pretty consistent. And of course, I, I think there's going to be a panel later on in the day about uh, immune-mediated toxicities with Dr. Postow, but the usual toxicities we expect from PD-1 or immunotherapy in general, endocrinopathies, skin issues, GI respiratory. Every now and again, there are these very unusual toxicities, myocarditis, a lot of the nerve issues, Guillain-Barre kinds of things, peripheral neuropathies, those uh, that you can also uh, rarely see. But in general, obviously, anti-PD-1 is far superior in terms of tolerability. <clears throat> So in terms of the Checkmate 238 study, just doing a deeper dive, um, this was the pre-specified subgroup analyses, and essentially you can see obviously that the, IPI, uh, the NEVO is doing far better than the IPI in essentially every subgroup that you're looking at, whether it's age, sex, or stage, and also with patients with higher risk disease, so those patients that had ulcerated primaries, those patients that had macroscopic disease compared to microscopic disease in their lymph nodes, and even beneficial in people with with the lower PDL1 expression, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later um, as well. And Dr. Weber recently presented this data at ESMO looking at biomarkers of response, and uh, essentially you can see that the patients uh, who get NEVO or IPI that respond the best to this therapy are those that have higher tumor mutation burden as well as higher uh, tumor interferon gamma expression levels, which is definitely something that is a pattern that we see in immunotherapy in general. 
And so finally, to, to talk a little bit um, about adjuvant-targeted therapy, and so there were two trials, I think, that bear some discussion. Uh, so the panel on the left, uh, right here is the COMBI-AD study, and we're going to get into this in detail, but basically surgically resected stage 3A to 3C, seventh edition melanoma, again, needed to have at least one millimeter tumor size in the lymph node, randomized to either placebo or dibrafenib, trametinib standard dosing for a year with primary endpoint of relapse free survival. The BRIM-8 study I, I sort of present here reluctantly, uh, as you'll see with the data, but um, this was a study that um, specifically looked at uh, seventh edition stage 2C to 3C melanoma patients with a BRAF mutation randomized to either placebo or just single agent vemurafenib, looking at the primary endpoint of disease-free survival. And what you can see here in this slide, so cohort one were the patients that were 2C to 3B, uh, and um, the study did meet its primary endpoint of improved uh, disease-free survival for single agent VEM with a hazard ratio of 0 0.54. However, the study did not meet its primary endpoint with the stage 3C or the higher risk patient populations with these curves essentially overlapping, and the panel on the right shows the entire cohort. Um, as we all know, single agent vemurapinib is terribly toxic. I, I, I've, I can't really recall using this uh, as a single agent much or uh, at all, uh, but a lot of skin toxicity issues, um, uh, photosensitivity, et cetera. Uh, but this is really the data with single agent uh, BRAF inhibitor in the adjuvant setting. I think more relevantly is the combi ad study, which looked at the dibrafenib, trametinib versus placebo. Uh, panel on the left here shows the relapse free survival curves, again, with a very healthy hazard ratio of 0.47. And this study did also um, present overall survival benefit as well, again, statistically significantly improved for the patients getting the dibrafenib and trametinib compared to the placebo. They also had um, ro uh, robust subgroup analysis, again, showing the benefit of the dibrafenib trametinib for essentially every category uh, that they looked at, uh, including type of BRAF mutation, gender, age, uh, stage, et cetera. They uh, recently published uh, longer-term follow-up data, so now you've got uh, data out to four years, and so panel A is the relapse-free survival curves, panel B is the distant metastasis-free survival curves, and then panel C was what uh, they called the cure rate model, and essentially what they're showing here is that they estimate that about 20% more patients are being cured by this uh, dibrafenib trametinib in the adjuvant setting compared to those that got placebo. They also um, did, uh, I'm sorry, this is the toxicities that, that are important. So obviously, these toxicities are very different uh, than the immunotherapy toxicities. As Dr. Sullivan told us earlier about, dibrafenib trametinib is definitely associated with a lot of pyrexia, and the way you manage these pyrexia episodes is obviously by initiating treatment dose interruptions, and so a majority of patients did require dose interruptions. About 40% required dose reductions. Uh, usually due to pyrexia issues, and about a quarter of patients could not complete the entire year just due to persistent side effect issues despite dose reduction and other um, uh, attempts to manage the side effects. There was also a biomarker uh, analysis done in this study. This was um, uh, presented about a year ago, and what they saw, saw here in the placebo-treated patients, those that actually did the best just with placebo uh, were those that had higher tum tumor mutational burden, um, and uh, obviously patients that had a higher interferon gamma signature also tended to do better in the placebo arm. Whereas with the dibrafenib trametinib treated patients, those patients um, with the interferon, higher interferon gene signature actually tended to do better, and that was independent of tumor mutation burden status. Uh, so very good data uh, with this study as well. And then just finally, this is sort of out of order, but uh, a recent development. This is the Checkmate 915 study. So this was the first study to actually use um, AJCC 8th edition. They, again, were looking at a higher risk population, so stage 3B to 3D, or stage 4 resected melanoma. 
melanoma. Uh, importantly, I don't believe this trial required completion nodal dissection. I think it was the first one that never uh, required completion nodal dissection. Um, and in this study, almost 2,000 patients were randomized to NEVO single agent uh, monthly versus uh, NEVO with a reduced dose IPI regimen, as you can see here, uh, with treatment being given for a year. And there were two uh, co-primary endpoints, including RFS specifically for patients with low PDL1 expression on their tumors, defined as less than 1%, and there was RFS for the all-comer population. And while there's no data that uh, I've been uh, privy to, at least, uh, there was a, a press release that was uh, released a couple months ago showing that there was not a statistically significant benefit for the primary endpoint of RFS for patients with low PDL1 expression in their tumors. However, the study is going on unchanged to look at the other endpoint, which is the RFS and the all-comer intent to treat population. So obviously, this is some early developments with this study and the final data set is, is obviously anxiously awaited. So I do think there's a number of unanswered questions, although there's been an amazing amount of uh, frantic discovery and uh, publications and FDA approvals in the last few years. Uh, we don't know if there's really an overall survival benefit with adjuvant anti-PD-1. Uh, we know there is with adjuvant IPI. We know there is with adjuvant dibrafenum trametinib, but don't have that data yet with either of the anti-PD-1 regimens. There's, of course, an ongoing debate on, in a BRAF mutated patient, should you be giving them anti-PD-1 or should you be using adjuvant BRAF MEC? And of course, we don't have any head-to-head -head comparisons. And so when I um, talk to my patients about this, I really just talk about side effects. Uh, and to me, that's what really helps to guide. Uh, I think, and you know, we all know that adjuvant uh, immunotherapy chance for longer term side effects. There are some patients that have potentially even permanent side effects, like a lot of the endocrinopathies, whereas the uh, adjuvant BRAF-MEC is maybe more issues with pyrexia that can be very difficult to manage, but these are short-term toxicities. Um, however, a, di a larger numerically percent of patients actually could not complete the entire BRAF uh, regimen compared to the immunotherapy regimens. Um, there isn't really any data that I'm aware of about rare mucosal subtypes, uh, mucosal melanomas, that is a total black box. I, I think with these more recent studies, mucosal patients were allowed to enroll on these adjuvant studies, but I feel like there were too few patients to actually even make any meaningful um, uh, generalizations of the data. Uh, and, of course, another very big unanswered question, of course, is that these patients, our patients now, are not getting completion nodal dissections. And essentially, all of the data that I showed you, all of these patients had completion lymph node dissections. And the fact that we're not routinely doing completion nodal dissections really increases the risk of local regional relapse uh, in these patients as well. And we don't have the data on how these more modern therapies are going to affect um, uh, local regional relapse. So to summarize, there really has been a lot of excellent progress uh, in adjuvant therapy with several newly FDA-approved treatment regimens, including checkpoint inhibitors as well as uh, BRAF and MEK combination uh, therapies. Uh, results show benefit across all baseline factors that were queried in these subgroup analyses. Again, we don't really know that BRAF MEK is superior to PD-1 or vice versa. I think it really comes down to a detailed discussion on potential side effects uh, when you're discussing this with your patients.